Retail's big show, the 2018 National Retail Federation, or the NRF Conference, is returning to New York City from January 14th to the 16th. For more than a century, NRF's annual convention has been an important gathering for industry leaders. Microsoft is one of the largest sponsors of this event, and this year, we are looking forward to having an in-depth conversation around home and online, front of house, back office, and connected supply. For more information about the event, visit www.nrfbigshow.com. And for me, I thought, you know, there's no one better to solve it. Like, men in Silicon Valley could not solve this problem for women. I can solve it. I get it. I really, really understand it. And I can find a way. So by women, for women is where we start. And that's what I'm passionate about. You are listening to the Women in Business and Technology podcast from Microsoft. In each episode, you'll hear from women in amazing technology and business roles, as well as male allies who are helping make the industries more inclusive. We are diving into programs that promote greater diversity in the pipeline and bringing you tips on how to build a successful career in a supportive community. Welcome to Women in Business and Technology. Welcome to Episode 7 of Women in Business and Technology. I'm Colleen O'Brien. And I'm Sonia Dar. This week, we're kicking things off in our Community Connect segment with a visit to the Grace Hopper Celebration, the world's largest gathering of women technologists. And then we'll jump into an interview I had with Ryan Buckley. She's the co-founder and CEO of FitCode, a tech company aspiring to make it easier for women to shop for jeans. Finally, we'll wrap things up in our Cutting Edge segment with a discussion on stats from Women in the Workplace 2017, a study on the state of women in the business world from Lean In and McKinsey & Company. Phew. All right. We have a lot to cover today, but at least the sun is no longer a distraction. (laughs) Yes, the rain has officially rolled into Seattle, but it's the perfect weather for curling up with some amazing coffee, which we have a lot of around here, (laughs) and a good book. Uh, Sonia, I know that your reading list has been growing pretty rapidly this season. What's on your agenda? Yeah, it's grown exponentially in the last few weeks. I'm I'm making my way through Women in Tech after our conversation we had with Tara Wheeler. She's a boss. I love her. And then also Reset by Ellen Powell is next on my list, which is a recommendation for my CVP. Yes, those are are both stellar book club reads. Personally, I've been making my way through Hit Refresh by Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella. He talks about the culture transformation happening at the company, which we talk a lot about on this podcast, and his vision for the future. But, you know, some of my favorite parts of the book are his personal stories about his background and his family. Yeah. Any anecdotes you think our listeners might be interested in? Yeah, I think so. Satya shares that a great deal of the empathy that he brings to his job at Microsoft is inspired by his son, Zane, who has severe cerebral palsy. He talks about his son's love of music and how three high school students were really inspired by Zane's story. The students built Zane an app to help him flip through his music collection by tapping his head against the side of his wheelchair, a task he wouldn't be able to do otherwise on his own. He was always needing other people to help him change the music he was listening to. And I really love this story. I think it's such a great representation of how inclusive design can empower everyone. I love that. And yes, absolutely. Along those lines of accessibility inclusion, Satya actually just mentioned this in his last company Q&A session, that October is National Disability Employment Awareness Month. And it's a campaign that the U.S. Department of Labor runs to reflect on the important role that different perspectives play in workforce success. And this year's theme is Inclusion Drives Innovation. If you want to learn more, you can find the resources that you can bring into your workplace by doing a quick Bing search for N-D-E-A-M. Community Connect. Get involved and stay connected. The Grace Hopper Celebration is the world's largest gathering of women technologists. 
Produced by AnitaB.org and presented in partnership with the Association for Computing Machinery. This year, the conference was held from October 4th through the 6th in Orlando, Florida, where philanthropist Melinda Gates, Stanford University AI Lab Chief Scientist Dr. Fei Fei Li, and Georgia Institute of Technology Engineering Professor Dr. Ayana Howard were among the amazing keynote speakers. Friend of the podcast, Tyler Ahn, was on site in Orlando, getting the inside scoop on why women were excited for the event. University of Northern Iowa computer science major Devin Christopher was attending the conference to do some networking and job hunting. I came to Grace Hopper just to meet a lot of new people and see what opportunities there are in the technology field. Indiana University computer science and mathematics student Sen Lee was looking for some inspiration from other women in the industry. I would love to meet amazing women in the technology field and hear the inspirational stories. Also talk to them and get ideas, get encouraged. While the conference does have great tracks for students, industry professionals also gather to learn about technology trends, to build new skills, and to connect with other professionals. Hi, my name is Mariana Baca. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. I am here on behalf of Athena Health. I'm a software developer trying to grow my career, so that is why I'm here at Grace Hopper. The 2018 Grace Hopper Celebration will be held from September 26th through the 28th in Houston, Texas. For more information, visit ghc.anitab.org. And now, on to the interview. I'm excited to welcome Ryan Buckley, the co-founder and CEO of FitCode. She's here on the show today with me. And Ryan, do you mind telling us a little bit about the company? Yeah, absolutely. It is such a pleasure to be here. FitCode is a fashion data company. And what we do is we specialize in women's denim, and we help retailers and brands solve the fit problem online. So as a customer, if you go to you know any of these big brand websites like Joe's Jeans and you see hundreds of images of jeans and you're like, oh, I don't know which ones to buy, which ones are going to fit me. What we do is we come on, we ask you five questions, and then we personalize that whole experience for you. So we make it seamless and really simple. And we say, hey, you know, let's take out all this noise out of the hundred jeans that are here. Here are the 10 that are going to fit you and what size to buy in them. Do you mind explaining a little bit of how the fit code process works? Yeah, absolutely. So FitCode, we mainly live on partner denim sites. So the reason behind that is we realized we didn't want to be a marketplace. Women don't need more marketplaces right now. They want to go where they understand the shopping experience, where it's trusted, which is right on a brand or retailer website. So that's where we live. As a customer, you'll see a little link that says, take your fit quiz. And from there, we ask you five questions. So we don't need measurements. We don't need body scans. We don't need anything like that. We just ask you five questions. It takes about 15 seconds. And then you get what we call a fit code. So fit code is a completely arbitrary three-digit number. We did that because we didn't want women associating it with anything yep. and, um, you know, ranking it or anything like that. And so then you get your three-digit number and we badge the experience. So what that means is when you're on a site like Joe's Jeans and you're on the listing page, so the page that shows all the jean images, we now put your fit code icon on any of those images that are going to fit you. So when you're scrolling through, it's just really easy to point out exactly what jeans you should look at. So an individual wouldn't be able to come up with her own fit code without filling out that quiz. Am I right? Yeah, so fit codes are not related to size. So they're related to shape. So you can have, you know, anything from a size zero to a size 24W within one fit code. The really interesting things that we're able to do with it is we have... I'd say three quarters of our business at this point is the data that we've collected as a byproduct of this. And we've now been able to consult with our denim partners and say, hey, we understand who your customer is now by body shape, which they've never seen before. So we can now say, you know, this percentage of your population looks like this. Let's make jeans for her. You know, you're missing your customer here. You're really nailing it here. And we can help them really narrow in on those business opportunities. So it sounds like FitCode is focused specifically on creating a better shopping experience for women. And you explicitly say this on the website, it's by women and for women. Why did you decide to focus on this demographic? 
You know, for me, especially as a young woman when I started this company, there is no better place to start. So I am passionate about solving things for women. I, you know, knew this problem intimately. I had modeled for years. I had modeled thousands of pairs of jeans. And so I knew this denim fit problem. And for me, I thought, you know, there's no one better to solve it. Like men in Silicon Valley cannot solve this problem for women. I can solve it. I get it. I really, really understand it. And I can find a way. So by women for women is where we start. And that's what I'm passionate about. So that's awesome. You modeled internationally for many retailers, including Lululemon, Nordstrom. How did you actually take that next leap and you actually throw your hat in as an entrepreneur? What was that defining moment? Yeah, you know, it really came down to a decision that I was going to be really disappointed if I didn't try. So I had modeled for years. I had listened to this problem. I had sat on set and listened to brands and retailers complain about the online return rates. And I would sit on the set with these jeans on that were clipped and pinned. And I saw this huge disconnect. And I said, you know, I'm seeing this from a unique angle. I'm in this position for a reason. I have a really interesting place to solve this from. And if I don't do it, someone else will. And when I see them be successful, I'm going to really regret that. So for me, it really just came down to this point of this is your time, Ryan. Try it now. Why not? Can you tell me a little bit about your approach to the funding process and any philosophies you have around there? Absolutely. So we all know the stat that 2% of VC or any sort of money goes to women founders and women businesses at this point. So going into this process, I knew I had to do things a little bit differently. And again, I think this is a pretty powerful place to come from. So I just previously said that, you know, women pitch businesses, men pitch unicorns. And I think that's how women should go into funding, too. And it's actually a really interesting place to come from. So since I didn't come from a business background, I really, you know, hadn't watched the funding process before. I just saw funding as debt, and that's truly what funding is. So it's a debt that empowers you to be able to scale your business and grow a business, but at the end of the day, it's still debt. And so my goal all along was to see how little funding I could take to make the business cash flow positive. So that's what I'm doing, and you know, I really encourage new people who are coming up in the funding world to think about it that way, that funding is still debt. You have to make money as a business. So, you know, don't go after these huge numbers unless you have really, really clear plans for it. And it's really going to lead you to more revenue in the long run. So you started it at the very young age of 26, which is very impressive. What is it like to lead a company at such a young age? And did that youth help or hinder you in the entrepreneurial process? You know, age for me has never really been a factor. I'm hoping I can carry that into when I, you know, hit 40 and 50, and hopefully it's not a factor in those ways too. But it's just one of those things that there is a bit of ignorance is bliss when you're young. And I went into this understanding what the problem was, knowing I could solve it. And I had no idea what it was going to take to do and how hard that was going to be to do. But that youth really gave me the energy and it gave me just the passion to solve it the right way. And so leading a company at the age of 26, I think if you are passionate about what you're doing, you support your employees, it doesn't matter how old they are, it doesn't matter if you're younger than them, they're going to trust you and they're going to trust that you have you know, the company's best interest in their best interest. Were there any role models in your life at that time, either during modeling or actually now with FitCode, that had helped you with this process and had convinced you to jump in? I have role models across my life. Um, looking back, none that were models that had gone into the tech space. And now that I've met you, you know, you've done the same thing. So that's awesome. We have people like Brooklyn Decker, who was at Create and Cultivate with us. And so we do have people who are going from modeling to tech, which is really, really cool. At the time, my biggest role model was my mom. She had breast cancer when I first started FitCode, and it gave me this amazing perspective to really understand that, you know, any stress that I was going to have in the business world, it was always a privilege. Because at the end of the day, you know, if we're happy and healthy, that's what matters. It was just an amazing place to go into a very stressful, very tough time when you're in a startup and realize that every single day when you come in, whatever problem you have, it's a privilege and it's really fun to be able to solve it. How many people are at the company now, and what was it like to become a people manager? So we have nine full-time employees. We have a few part-time contractors. You know, being a people manager was something that I never went out and set out to do, but it has probably been the most rewarding part of this business. So I really tried to practice what I preach, and I didn't go to business school. I graduated with a degree in political science and a passion for ocean conservation, and then I was the CEO of a tech company. So when I went out trying to hire people, I didn't look at their resumes. I didn't look at where they went to school. I really didn't care. What I wanted was a bunch of very scrappy, um, very, very passionate individuals who I knew would work hard for our company and really find creative solutions. And that's what we've been able to do. 
too. So really watching these people that I brought on just excel and grow in their own jobs has been awesome. One common theme we try to pull out in our podcast is you don't have to have a tech background to be in tech. Like I studied economics, Colleen studied visual arts, and I think it's amazing that you're able to pull these people together and the drive is what's the important part. But have you felt the need to like double back and shore up on any of your tech skills because of that? Or is it on the job that you guys have been able to like learn and kind of grow together with your company and build up those tech skills that are involved? Yeah, so I haven't had to go back and learn the tech skills. I have a really good dev team. I really let them be the experts there. I've definitely learned on the fly um, at least how to speak to the technology because as the CEO, I'm the one out there selling it. And so I have to talk to all these brands and retailers and I have to understand, you know, how our product works and how we integrate and all of that. So I've definitely gotten a quick lesson from our dev team in, you know, all the different technology workings of our product, but not having the technical background background and also not having the business background, I think, is the reason why we are where we are today is because I didn't see how big of a problem this was and I didn't see how much work was going to go into it. And I was able to just dive right in and say, we're going to do this. And it, you know, it gave me this beautiful place of kind of having the blinders on and not being held back by limitations to other people who knew the problem maybe would have experienced. So going back, you had mentioned the Brooklyn Deckers joining and kind of going from this model to entrepreneur. But in general, the commonality is that there are not a lot of women in this area. So TechCrunch had reported back in April 2016 that only 7% of partners at the top 100 venture firms are women. So what were the demographics of your VC meetings? Were there women there? Or what was it like to communicate the Valley prop of your product to men? Because you mentioned how the Silicon Valley men probably aren't going to be tackling this problem, but it is a problem that you had pointed out and you were willing to take it. But what was that breakdown like? Were there women there in the VC firm? So our funding process was a little different. We didn't have to go out and try to get VCs on from the beginning. We had one investment firm here on the east side called Harvey Partners, and it is led by a man. But he had a lot of foresight, and he really is trying to invest in companies led by women. He started this before it really became a buzzword, and he understands that women-led companies really have – They have an organization about them. I read somewhere that men pitch unicorns and women pitch businesses. And I really think it's a great way to think about it. You know, we are underrepresented in leadership. And because of that, we have to pitch really strong business cases. We don't really get to have the privilege and luxury of pitching these unicorns. And because of that, we're pretty good investments to make. So he was ahead of the curve on that one. That's awesome. I wanted to make a mention to our listeners that FitCode is a Seattle-based company, so woo, woo. <laughs> got to represent. We're very excited for that. In our previous episodes, we had talked about CurvyCon. I don't know if you're familiar with CurvyCon. Absolutely. But it's a runway show and gathering of fashion bloggers focused on plus-size clothing that now was actually integrated into New York Fashion Week, which is a huge one. How does your company fit into this broader conversation about inclusivity in the fashion industry? Oh, man, the two go hand in hand. So this This is another one of my big passion projects. So FitCode's main goal is that we want to get any woman into jeans that fit. So I am personally very tired of hearing about the plus size market. I don't think it should be called plus size. I think it should be inclusive sizing. I mean, it's so old and it's so tiresome to hear it. Talking to big brands and retailers, I cannot tell you how many times I have talked to the heads of companies and who are struggling. You know, we all read the news. We all understand where the retail industry is at right now. And they tell me the reason why they're not going to Plus is because they think the Plus shopper is a discount shopper. And sitting there across the table from them, I'm looking at the facts of the matter. I understand that the average American woman is a size 16. 67% of American women are size 14 and up. You know, the plus size market is valued at $20.4 billion. Billion. Billion dollars. (laughs) I mean, this is a very big market. These are just women who want clothes that fit. And so, you know, my biggest mission, my biggest thing that I tell all of my partners is, you know, we can help you right now. We can help you increase sales and decrease returns. But the way you help yourselves is to be inclusive. Get all women into jeans that fit. What has FitCode been doing event-wise or maybe online that has been tackling this issue? So the first thing we did is we really started reaching out to plus size denim brands. So we got them on because we have a big plus size following too because of our message. And, you know, we really do want to help all women get into jeans that fit. The second thing we do is we consult with our partners. So if they're trying to grow their plus size business, we consult with them and we say, hey, you know, this is who your customer is. This is her body shape. Let's make jeans that really fit her. And then for our partners who don't have plus size, we are always encouraging them, go that direction. That's where the money is. 
congratulations. You have 95,000 Fit Code users right now. Woohoo. Um, woo. um, and for all the entrepreneurs listening, do you have any advice about how you get the word out about your idea and how you can attract more users to your product? Yeah, you know, I think for anyone who's starting something, you're going to hear a lot that you need to go out and get a PR agency. And that's something that we did in the very beginning. And then we realized we didn't have to do. So as an entrepreneur and as someone who's trying to follow a tight budget, you really have to look at your dollars and your spends. And we realize that if you have a product that can gain a lot of interest because you're actually solving a problem, you're solving it for people and they can understand the problem and it's a bit of an emotional issue for them, they're going to grasp on. And so we have an amazing marketing director, Stephanie Chacharone, and she's been able to go out and do all the PR herself and just say, hey, let's create this product that is really, really personal for people. They can really understand what we're doing. They understand the problem and they want to tag along with us. That's awesome. And I know you guys also did a couple of in-person events. Um, mm -hmm. You call them Fit Labs? Yeah, we do Fit Labs. Fit Labs, so you can go in person and you can actually show women directly what the Fit Code... Remind me, you said it's not an API, but it's basically... Yeah, so it's uh, so what we do with our partners is we integrate our JavaScript onto their e-commerce sites. The Fit Labs are a little different. So what we do is we work with our brands and we say, hey, we can now bring this Fit Code experience in store. So if you take a brand, um, you know, Joe's, AG's, Hudson, Jag, Silver, whoever you want, and we can say, hey, we can go right into your store. And when women walk into your store, instead of being confused when you see hundreds of jeans in the store, you can now just organize them by Fit Code rack. So if she comes in, she takes her five question quiz right in store and says, hey, I'm a Fit Code 500, the customer service rep can now say, oh, here's a rack of jeans that are going to fit you. So now you get a shop just by style and not have to wonder what's going to fit and have those you know, terrible dressing room experiences we've all had. <laughs> oh, my God. Like for half an hour, you're feeling really bad about really yourself bad. trying to squeeze into jeans. or Yeah. Um, which also, side note, people need to get better lighting in dressing rooms. I don't understand that. <laughs> like they make you feel not very, yeah. <laughs> very beautiful. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to pick your brain a little bit more about uh, being the CEO of your company and kind of this, it shouldn't be a new conversation, but it has come up again about how few women there are and the consistent issue, right? So mm -hmm. last year, Rockefeller Foundation released a study on chief executives that demonstrated significant gender biases. For example, when a company led by a woman was in a crisis, 80% of the news stories cited it was the CEO that was the source of the problem, whereas this only happened about 31% of the time when it was a man running the mm. company. Do you experience any unique treatment or biases as being a female CEO? You know, I absolutely have. Going into this, I would have said that I hadn't faced sexism or anything like that in the workplace. And really looking back even on my career modeling and now, you know, the four years I've been CEO of this company, it's abundantly clear that I have. And it is really, really an empowering place to come from, actually. So, I mean, I usually have a positive outlook on things, but I really do feel strongly that anything that's happened to me just because I'm a woman leader instead of a man leader is actually putting me in a place of power. So I use the example sometimes that the reason why I was able to create Fit Code is because as a model, you're a bit invisible sometimes. So people think about you just as like this clothes hanger when you're on set. They don't realize that there's probably a pretty smart person behind that pretty face. And so I was able to sit on set at lunch breaks and get this inside information to what the pain points of these retailers are. And it's been the same thing as a CEO. People always will underestimate you. And when they underestimate you, you can get so much awesome information. So use it to your power. You know, they'll talk about things right in front of you because they think you're not listening or they think you're not going to understand. And it's like, hey, I'm listening and I really understand. I'm going to solve that problem. In June of this year, Fortune.com reported that the number of women CEOs on the Fortune 500 actually increased, which is awesome, mm -hmm. from 21 to 32. What advice would you have for our female listeners with ambitions to become company leaders? I think the biggest thing is get with a product that you can really stand behind. So we're focused in women's denim right now. We're going to extend to men's denim. We're going to extend to other apparel. But it has been really interesting seeing how many men are at the head of women's denim companies. And they're awesome and they're creative, but it is so empowering. I just did an interview with the CEO of Joe's Jeans, Susie Biznance, and she was so interesting about you know, the state of the industry and her experience in it because, you know, she is the consumer of her own product and that's a place of power too. And so if you can be your own consumer, you can lead the company. And that's what it is with Fit Code. You know, every day when I'm talking to my dev team and we have all these exciting places we can bring the technology, I always go back to, hey, 
right here, like the women on the team, we're the customer right now. So if we're not going to use this, let's not go there because there are a lot of really cool technologies you can build. But if the customer is not going to use it at the end of the day, it's not the right place for your business. So where can our listeners find you online, both FitCode and then Ryan Buckley? Yeah, so you can find our company at fitcode.com. We're also integrated. We just integrated with Joe's Jeans. We have Hudson Jeans, AG Jeans, Jag, Silver. So on any of their e-commerce websites, you'll see the Take the Fit Quiz little button. But then also just my personal things. I'm on um, Instagram at Ryan and B and Twitter at Ryan B. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you. This is awesome. Cutting Edge, our take on stories in the business and technology world. On October 10th, Lean In and McKinsey and & Company released Women in the Workplace 2017, an annual study on the state of women in the business world. According to Lean In founder Sheryl Sandberg, the study is part of a long-term partnership to encourage female leadership and achieve gender equality in the workforce. But this year's findings demonstrate that there's still a long way to go. One data set from the study shows that only 3% of people in the C-suite are women of color. And women comprise only 21% of those executive roles all up, which is crazy. The takeaway from this data is that women fall behind early and lose ground with every step. Fewer women than men are hired at the entry level, and representation declines through the promoting funnel. Actually, I'm pretty sure Tara Wheeler, we talked to her about this. And it's unfortunate that the statistic exists, but women are 18% less likely to be promoted than their male peers. The most heartbreaking findings in this report for me are about how men think their companies are doing a pretty good job of supporting diversity. 63% of men versus 49% of women think that their respective companies are doing what it takes to improve gender diversity in the workplace. And only 47% of men report that gender diversity is a very important or top personal priority. We've spoken about the importance of male allyship and advocacy on this show, and these numbers demonstrate that we need to more aggressively bring men into the conversation to really move the needle on these numbers. Yeah, fortunately, the report is prescriptive, too, and it doesn't just leave us wallowing in these somewhat depressing findings, thank God. Instead, it boldly presents a roadmap to gender equality, promoting tips like ensuring that hiring and promotion processes are fair and encouraging work-life flexibility. So if you're passionate about getting your team or your company up to speed on gender diversity in the workplace, Or maybe you're a people manager and you could actually enact some of these more inclusive recommendations. Please take the time to check out the full report at womeninTheWorkplace.com. Nice work today, Sonia. That was another great episode. I agree. A really big shout out and a big thank you to all of our listeners who've already shared the podcast. We really appreciate the momentum you're helping us build. And to those, if you haven't already shared the podcast, we would really appreciate it if you did. Yes. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. And as always, if you have any feedback or questions, please email us at wibt at microsoft.com or tweet us at Microsoft Women. Many of you have probably noticed or participated in the most recent social media wave of the hashtag MeToo movement. Sunday, October 15th, Alyssa Milano used her Twitter account to encourage women who'd been sexually harassed or assaulted to use this hashtag. Sophie Gilbert wrote about the movement in The Atlantic, quote, It isn't a call to action or the beginning of a campaign. It's simply an attempt to get people to understand the prevalence of sexual harassment and assault in society. The website RAINN.org manages a lot of resources for sexual assault prevention, as well as a hotline, 800-656-HOPE. To all the women out there, we hear you. And we're with you.